you have to understand that I was never cut out for honest toil. I never really had a nine to five job all my life, just vaguely, maybe two or three months of my whole life. I didn't like actually going to getting up, going to work every day. So when I discovered that there was a living to be made from bridge activities, I decided that I would try to see if I could survive uh, through bridge. And so I did, I tried it, and I played rubber bridge for money, and uh, I taught, and I wrote articles, and it worked out quite well, and I, I was my own boss, I kept my own hours and stuff. Now why bridge appealed to me, I, I really, I, I can't tell you. At the beginning, it, it was just replaced getting a job. Really. But later on I grew into it because it is a game, obviously, that you can never master. When I left college, I spent a few months in Jamaica. And then I moved to England for about two years. And that's where I really progressed. Um, I, played, I started playing at a club called Lederers, which is a very famous club uh, in Mayfair in those days. And among the people who used to play there was a fellow called Adam Meredith. He's probably not very well known here, but he was a great player in, in his day. My, I played in the trials, in the British trials, when I was 22 years old. And I was playing, I was sort of conscripted to play on Meredith's team. And I was um, played with a fellow called Norman Squire, who was a great theoretician, and we'd never played together before. And we really did, did very well, including we beat the then world champions, which was Terence Reese's team, in the first match. So that was like the highlight of my career in London. But then I left town three weeks later and came to Canada. Well, when I first came to town, uh, Eric used to play with a fellow called Doug Drury. They were probably, they and uh, another pair from Toronto called Percy Sheardown and Bruce Elliott were probably the top team in Canada. And, uh, but he, about a year after I came to town, or a year and a half, Doug Drury left to go to California, and Eric was partnerless. He tried it, uh, to form a partnership with Bruce Elliott, but that didn't work. And, but I was sort of like the neck, as good a player as, as was available at the time, except that uh, it, was, it would be undignified for somebody of Eric's stature to uh, uh, invite me to be his partner, you see. So somebody came to me, like a, a middleman, came over and said to me, I think Eric would like to play with you. Would you like to play with Eric, you see? Uh, so I said, sure. And we got along, we got along famously right from the beginning. Uh, there, was, there was never any problem. We had the similar views on, on methods. Uh, and our, the reason our partnership actually survived all these years it was one, one, one good reason, and that was we were conflicting personalities at the table. He was a mover. He did things. He created things. He didn't mind looking foolish. You know, he didn't mind taking chances and falling flat on his face and losing lots of points. I, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. I, I tried to play with just without making any errors. I wasn't trying to win any points. I was just trying not to lose them. So because of the different uh, philosophies, we sort of meshed well, because if we were both movers, it wouldn't have worked so well. I think the first tournament that we won was the uh, 1964 Spring Gold, which was right here in Toronto. It was the first national tournament they had in Toronto. And I remember that quite distinctly for this reason. We were, had a pretty good reputation at that time. And Eric received an invitation, I think it was from Edgar Kaplan, who asked us to join his team. He was playing with, I think, Norman Kay and Pear, who was probably the best pair in America at that time, uh, Jordan and Robinson. And Eric was inclined to join them. But I said, look, it's a go the tournament's going to be in Canada. We have to play with the Canadian team, the team we normally played with, with Sheardown and Elliott, the team we normally played with. 
and we really have to play with it because it's in Canada. So we played, and virtue was its own reward because we wound up winning it, and it was a double elimination, and we went through undefeated, which was, you know, considering that, you know, Elliot was not a well person because he had cerebral palsy. And uh, it was, we were only a four-person team, so it, it was sort of strenuous, uh, uh, particularly for Elliot. And uh, so that worked out very well. And then we went, to, <laughs> we went to Chicago the following year for the Spring Gold uh, with the same four-man team. And uh, we won again, and another double knockout. So, I mean, that, that was probably the highlight of our career. Uh, although we played, uh, we, we played but never won. We played in many Olympiads for Canada and I think three Bermuda Bowls for North America, uh, winning none, I might add. But in those days, no American team won anything for the obvious reason that the Italian blue team won everything. The, the hand that really started our international career was in 1965 in San Francisco. We were playing in the trials to select a team for the Bermuda Bowl. It was the last match. We, we were contending with about two other pairs to qualify. And the pair we were playing against was also contending. There was, as I mentioned earlier, Arthur Robinson and Bobby Jordan, who was probably the best player in America at that time. And we were playing, and the, matches, the match was going slightly against us. And we, Eric and I got into a contract of six, no Trump. I won't bore you with the details, but it came down to a situation where I had to play either for a finesse or a squeeze. And the odds were exactly even in terms of what cards remained, whether the person on my right was squeezed or I could take the finesse against his partner. And I thought and I thought and I thought. And I couldn't get any clues, I had no idea. I finally had to make a decision. And what I decided, I decided to take the finesse. The reason I decided to take the finesse was because the contact was going to be normal. It was, you know, the hands were played by everybody at the same time, uh, eight other pairs. And they're all going to be in slam, and they're all going to be faced with the same problem that I was being faced. It was going to come down to that. And I formed the conclusion that experts are more likely to play for a squeeze than a finesse. As experts do that sort of thing. You know, they like to play for squeezes. So I decided that since the match was going slightly against us, I would play against the field because the scores were compared against everybody. So I would take the finesse because if I succeeded, I was going to win a lot of points from the people who played for the squeeze. And sure enough, the finesse succeeded. And we qualified for the team because of that hand. Had I played for the squeeze, we would have finished sixth or something it was a, because it was a slam hand. And that, and we qual that was the first time we played... Uh, for North America in the Bermuda Bowl. And that really set us, that one hand <laughs> really put us, you know, on our road, as it were, to international uh, uh, events. I could have probably prospered in a different environment if it wasn't for Bridge, but uh, I probably wouldn't have had as much fun or as much free time. <laughs>